If I'm not mistaken, this is the first homecoming in the history of why the world needs anthropologists. When the emerging European network was examining new fields for applied anthropology in 2013, Anna Kira was so kind to, to deliver her keynote lecture. Today, the internationally renowned and respected design anthropologist and psychologist will tell us how to avoid the apocalypse. Welcome, Anna. Hello, I just want to first say I'm dedicating this to Thomas Hilan Eriksson, who is very ill uh, and a very dear friend of mine. Um, but I also want to thank Jamer because uh, he just warmed my heart coming from academia because I'm the opposite. I'm a, a practitioner. I do uh, teach at a university in Norway, um, but I do not teach as an anthrop well, I do teach as an anthropologist, but I teach in the product design and service design department of the university, not in the anthropology department. Um, and I had some very quick comments I, I wanted to say, and the first was this word between. Um, I loved it, and it's also something that I uh, have reflected over that where does the magic happen in the work that I've done in the last 35 years? It's always happened in transitions and in the between. So I really think you're uh, onto something. You need to write a paper on it because it was brilliant. And uh, I'll come back to the unknowns because that's also something uh, that I think a lot about. But I have a definition just came up while you were sitting, uh, or I was sitting listening to you, on the difference between designers and anthropology. And for me, it's not about the mindset at all. It's actually about how you practice. And uh, what I have seen uh, time and time again in 35 years is that designers spend six weeks at least planning how they're going to get lost in the woods. Whereas anthropologists just go out and get lost in the woods. And that's really one of the main differences that I, I see. Otherwise, I, I would almost disagree with his overlap because I think there's a much stronger overlap. And I find myself out in the woods in the un unknown of the unknowns more often than not because I get hired into places where I know shit. You know, I know nothing. And so then I, I'm in there, you know, kind of like, and that's, you take the step out and you figure it out as you go along. Whereas a, a, a designer, same situation, they're sitting there and planning and planning. So how are we going to do this? And when's the kickoff going to be and so forth? And I, I just don't understand. But anyway, I, that was uh, something I wanted to comment on. And I'll, I'll try and uh, leave that alone because I think I'm going to go over time. And I'm sorry. I just need to apologize. Um, <laughs> Today is a series of reflections as a practitioner of design anthropology. And I need to start at the beginning because in the beginning is the end and in the end is the beginning. And that is quoting T.S. Eliot's quartet and is very important to me in this time in my life. I'll come back to that uh, later. I'd like to tell you first about the two most influential people in my life. And curiously enough, they were not anthropologists. Both are artists. However, they paved the way and gave me a lens to absorb anthropology in every single cell of my body and to maintain something that Jamer mentioned, which is to me the most important thing I carry with me, and that is my curiosity and creativity in everything I do. So the two people are Barry Mosier, my high school art teacher, and Ben Sean, um, a Harvard art professor who wrote the book Shape of Content in 1957, or 56, I'm not sure which. Um, Barry gave me this book when I was 16 years old. And it was at a time when I was trying, the nice way of saying it was, I was contemplating the meaning of life. Okay, that's the nice way of saying it. It was much more dramatic than that. But he gave me this book. And um, the book starts by saying there is no content of knowledge that will not be relevant to the work you do. None. And uh, that struck me. And later, he talks about the word or writes about the word integrity, which he defines as being unified. The unity, uniting of everything you do, how you act, your attitude, how you work, 
how you think, and the knowledge that you obtain. How all this, connecting the dots, gives you integrity. And it also means that no one subject matter will ever be enough. The book continues, though. It says, and I have uh, uh, translated it because it was written by a man-man who wrote about men-men, and I wanted this to be about humanity and people. So I've just made some adjustments. Uh, <laughs> Is it possible that the lack of a holistic mindset turns people into technicians and cuts them from the chaos, the accidents, and intuitions of the creative process. Perhaps we may move again toward that antique and outdated ideal, the whole person. And what strikes me is that this statement right here is perhaps the most critical statement we have for the future. And I took the name of this conference so literally that I want to talk about the future, not, not right now. Um, and uh, this, is, this is really important to me in terms of that. Um, there's also a chapter in this book um, that has a list of things to do before I choose my career, right? Before you choose a career. And I took this list very literally when I was 16 and followed every single thing on the damn list. Um, and I know that this li list is what saved my life. This list is what opened my eyes, and this list is what helped me to strive each and every single day to try to be a better human being. And it showed me the way to anthropology and design. And I'm, I'm going to give you one thing on the list. One item on the list says to be grounded by always keeping your hands in the soil. The list actually tells you to go to uh, Europe and pick grapes, which I did. And go into, uh, go pick potatoes in the field, which I did and how I got to Norway. Um, and to feel the earth in your hands, to smell the earth, to use all of your senses. Funny that researchers now have linked having your fingers in the earth with the development of serotonin in your brain and to mental well-being. Isn't that strange? They've actually discovered that now. Um, but back to, uh, back to whatever. I'm a practitioner. As a practitioner, my job has often been to facilitate the unveiling of truths, not a truth, but truths, for my employers, my clients, my students, my employees, uh, my colleagues, my friends. I have always said that there is no one truth that in any argument we have, both sides are correct, but only partially. This is very important. Context and culture at any given moment, of course, play a very important role in what truth is. But there is actually one truth. The world is changing and will continue to change, and we are part of that change as long as we breathe on this planet. I forgot to mention that this uh, graffiti, some of you from the Dutch may recognize it. It's a very famous Dutch uh, graffiti artist. He's a very dear friend of mine, and he is saying that nature and humanity will save the world, and it's all the fucked up things in the world on the back. Uh, but I love this uh, image as what it's about avoiding the apocalypse. I've tried to keep up with the fast pace of change. You know, these are made by men for men, by the way. You know, you have to remember to bring a belt. Um, I have tried to keep up with the face, at fast pace of change. I have tried to make sense of the world we live in, and I've tried to connect some of the dots. And the reflections that I'm going to give you now are based on what I am seeing and not seeing in design and engineering consultancies, in our corporations, in our organizations, and in within academia around the world, except for the new school. <laughs> it's my belief as educators and practitioners that we are responsible for guiding and facilitating reflected change for the good of our people, 
our communities, our nations, and our planet. And to do that, we have to save humanity. I'm not going to waste your time today talking about the positive effects of our work. We know those things. Anyone can do that. And we have reason to be proud of the work we do in designing objects, services, and organizational change. What I want to talk about are two things that are interwoven, interlinked. The negative consequences of our work and the areas we have completely neglected. So to begin at the end again, these two things, the negative consequences of our work in areas we have neglected are what we need to focus more on now and in the future. And what I'm talking about is the foundation of ethical practice. The reason I am here today is that I have a fundamental belief in humanity, the goodness and light in each and every human being. If we had some way, some magical way to collect on this, the goodness in each of us in this room and outside of this room, some way to merge all of this incredible goodness, we can and we will avoid the looming apocalypse and fall of humanity. But before I go further, let me first walk you through my simplified definition of design as I have worked with it. Design is simply problem solving. Um, it's a, simply a way of problem solving using what is called the design mindset. And I know uh, for quite sure that engineers feel the same way that they are problem solving. And basically all dis disciplines are problem solvers. Um, and in fact, they're all trying to solve real problems. But there are differences in the way we solve problems. Um, as a design anthropologist, I would propose that we not argue about disciplines, but learn to solve problems together with our different mindsets. And this brings me to actually the title of uh, your job, which I just uh, really warmed my heart, this Vice Provost of Transdisciplinary Initiatives. Because um, what I am talking about is the power of transdisciplinary, uh, trans disciplinarity um, or transdisciplinary work because in my opini opinion it is grossly undervalued and I'm gonna come back to this but let's go on to back to design so when I talk about design most people think of form and function and these are some of my random favorites the old telephone number 302 uh, the Shemex coffee uh, can, I just love that. John Deere is almost like having sex for me. I just love them. I got to r drive my own first John Deere actually this last summer. And so, I mean, it's just, it was fantastic. Um, Coca-Cola bottles, the red telephone box, and one of my personal favorites, um, it, it's the only thing I fought over in my divorce 15 years ago, was the trip trap stool. And uh, Peter uh, Obsvik, who uh, designed this, is in fact uh, the person who sponsors Design Without Borders, which I'm associated with. All of these designs represent, and here's the key, all of those designs represent designing for a use or for people. The word for is key here. We're designing for. And we can discuss about you know, why they became iconic, uh, why they were deemed aesthetically pleasing, um, and how they are a perfect balance between form and function. But design is still about form and function, but it's so much more. Um, more recently, we moved from designing for people to designing together with the people we serve. Um, what this means is that we go where the people are and we involve them in the design process. And this has led me to the remote re region of Karamoja in Uganda to facilitate the uh, creation of a service for a starving tribe. And uh, it also uh, took me uh, to a year traveling on long haul airline uh, flights 
to figure out how a plane manufacturer could improve the experience of passengers, pilots, and flight attendants in long haul flights, result being the Dreamliner. Um, and all, these are all co-creation collaboration projects. I've been to so many, I'm just pointing these two out as an example. And designing with, instead of for, the people we serve is not just a workshop with users so we can check off that we've involved them. There's a little too much of that going around. It means that we fundamentally change our mindset and practice. And Jamer again spoke of this because who's the expert in their own life? It's not us. We have to ex accept that people are ex experts in their own lives and involve them in the making of things. We as designers can work with them to uncover both articulated and unarticulated needs. We as designers continue to work with them to test out our ideas, to gather their ideas, and to visualize our understanding so that we can validate our results together with them and create solutions to the challenges together with the people we serve. And this requires something very important of us. To move from designing for to designing with, you have, it requires the art of being humble and the art of removing our ego. So often in my meetings, I have a box outside where you have to leave your ego or your expert hat or whatever. Because in collaboration, you have to kind of be reminded that we have an ego. We all do. So put it aside for at least an hour, you know, when you're in that meeting. So uh, one of the things that I'm thinking about for the future is that uh, there's an evolution here. It's design, we, we started with designing for, that was the original kind of design world, and we've moved to designing with, and what we really need to be working on now is designing change through facilitation. And I will explain this as we go along. Um, w the point to this is I feel we have to harvest the collective intelligence of different disciplines to solve, and again, repeating Sara and uh, Jamer, to solve the wicked problems we're faced with. Um, as a design anthropologist, I've studied and collaborated with people and cultures all over the world to impact the design and development of products, services, and organizational change. And what's important is insight. And knowing when one has insight, that's going to make a difference. And technologies today are increasingly giving us opportunities we never had before to investigate that insight. But my job in a nutshell, and I have this picture up for a reason, has been to help my clients understand other perspectives than their own. To help them see that there are more than one way to see the mountain, the same mountain. And most of the conflicts are very easily solved when we help people see that they're, they're just talking about one side of the mountain. And if someone else gets to, they can get up in that helicopter, look at it, they can see that they're talking about the same things from those different perspectives. And it's at that moment the magic happens. It's that moment that you really see the power of transdisciplinary thinking because it's at that moment that you, we realize that it's not about the process or the models and all of the structures that we put in place. It's about how we push each other and come up with new models new ways of thinking, and we are desperately in need of that today. So what it happens in this facilitation is that we're uncovering the truths behind the truths to help our, our customers or our clients improve their products and services or come up with new disruptive ones. Um, and often it requires organizational change, and that happens by itself, it's a byproduct of this way of facilitating. And one thing that I see missing uh, in a lot of academia, again, I'm not talking about new school, so you're okay. In fact, you just, you know, I'm, uh, 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 one thing missing is that we are educated, uh, is the way we are educated. And also within what I've seen in public and private sectors. Um, uh, we're missing this, 
this true transdisciplinarity, um, that people are on a equal playing field uh, working together to solve these problems. And by being on an equal playing field, despite having different subject matter expertise, we actually not only solve the problems, we come up with those new models and new ways of thinking. And no one discipline has the answer. No one model is going to solve these problems. And um, so then you might be asking, so what are these wicked problems? And that's what I want to talk about for the rest of the time. One is the rapid advancement, the exponential growth of technologies. They are changing the way we are born, the way we live, the way we love, the way we hate, the way we die. Let's take a look at what that is. So you mentioned this, so I'm going to go really quick, uh, Jamer, uh, on this one. Uh, and that is that technology has given us democratization of knowledge. We can Google ourselves to a PhD today. Knowledge is there. I do not understand why we have schools teaching maths and sciences and all these uh, in such boring ways when today kids can game themselves to just about any subject matter. Um, but what they cannot game themselves to are two things. And one is critical thinking. They cannot get that from the internet. And who is teaching how to be human, how to be social? today because the parents are, they're too busy working and they're too exhausted when they get home and the teachers aren't because they're stuck in this old antiquated way of working. So who is teaching the kids? Social media is making us stupider. You know, I, I'm the one who yelled uh, when you showed a picture and called somebody Voldemort because for me, they're gentle lambs now, Bush. It's just a gentle lamb in comparison. I mean, I, yeah. So we're, we're done with that. But the point here is there's something very important. Social media is making us stupider. Research indicates that this is actually happening uh, because we are only hang out with people just like ourselves. We lock out people who disagree with us. We stop being analytical and we live in a world where facts don't matter, post-factual world. That was mentioned earlier today in the introductory talks. And when only our people who agree with us matter. But here's the catch. The Trump phenomenon is everywhere. It's in Norway, in Sweden, in Denmark, in Finland, in Portugal, in Germany. It's everywhere. And it's sitting probably even in this room. You think not. This scares the shit out of me. In my view, the creators. and. I'm one of them, of digital social media. The creators have, have betrayed us. We have not thought about the consequences of this super form of communication. And in my, in my view, betrayal is fraud. We were sold the possibility of connecting to each other, but no one's thinking of the consequences of this superhuman way of connecting. What has it done to us? What is it doing to our children? We're not thinking about ways to mitigate. And then the real problem is that we're overwhelmed. And this comes to, this is my catch, because you kept talking about the unknowns. The real catch is every single one of this in, our, in this room probably feels it at least once a day. How in the hell do I know what I do not know I do not know I need to know in order to get my job done? Have you been there before? I thought about it on my way stressed out. I did a talk yesterday. I had to go get to the airport within 45 minutes because I know my plane's going, but I can't remember which airline I'm taking and where's the ticket and where's the this and where's the that. I have five e different email accounts I have to find uh, and look through to figure out which one Dan sent it to me on. Oh, shit. That's my everyday life. It's kind of stressful. Um, with all the threats out there, OK. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that out. Um, 
What I dream of doing is, and I do it in fact, is escape to the woods and dream of a life without electricity, without computers, without the pressures I have in my everyday life to be productive, efficient. And everyone tells us be more productive, more efficient all the time. Thomas Hilan Erickson, he predicted this in his book, Tyranny of the Moment. If you haven't read it, it is an excellent read. Please read it. Um, and it tells us, and yet we sit there and accept it. We accept it. We accept the push. We're afraid of losing our jobs. We're afraid of whatever. And we, we in the room have to fight back. We have to get, we have to fight what is happening because it is attacking the basis of humanity. Um, why is it that you can't just love me and accept me as I am? That's all I want. And I need to be clear here. I'm not afraid of my mobile phone. I'm not afraid of the internet of everything. I'm not afraid of big data and nanotechnology and robotics and artificial intelligence. I get goosebumps thinking of all the greatness that can come from it. What I'm afraid of is what people can do with technology and that we don't think about the consequences of what we have made or are making. We have some huge challenges out there that I have grouped into four categories. And the first one is globalization. We have progressed. We are a world where we have come so far that at a click of a finger, we can travel the whole world and that same world comes right at us. And those worlds are coming into our lives and they are colliding. And it comes with dilemmas, lots of dilemmas. Deep polarization is occurring globally. This is the ultra right wing politician in Norway creating hate. She is creating hate, promoting hate. What good comes from promoting hate? Why? In Europe and in Africa, we have the Syrian crisis and political, economic, uh, and environmental refugees are on the rise. We are increasingly see, seeing a world of us and them. And there is a reason Trump was elected. There is a reason that we have a party promoting racism in Norway. With rapid change comes fear. And any anthropologist knows that us and them is central in the discussion of humanity. But remember our ethnography, ethnographies. What creates balance in an us and them situation? What can we learn from joking relationships? What can we learn from the Kalahari, from the Kung? Uh, Kung? I will come back to that in a moment because we can learn a lot. We have an increase in the difference between people who have and who do not have. My daughter cannot afford to buy an apartment. She does not have rich parents who can subsidize her. And I'm not sure I can afford the apartment I just bought in Oslo. These words say keep Norway clean. How do we design for equality when the voice that is loudest is pushing the way? Who is designing for places to live in collectives? Who is designing for our future when we have to live differently for so many reasons and we have to learn to live with people who think differently than ourselves? So how do we change mindsets? How do we listen to the fears of the disenfranchised and create a human society? How do we stop polarization? The Ajamani Youth Challenge aimed for a mindset change benefiting both refugees and host communities. Uganda hosts over one million refugees. Host communities in Uganda are challenged with increased competition over employment opportunities, scarcity of social services, and environmental degradation. To enhance peaceful coexistence, empower youth to take an active role in their future, the United Nations Development Program, together with Design Without Borders, implemented what we called a design training for youth by youth from Ajumani. This is a community hosting 200 refugees. The key here is that we started with tools around human-centered uh, design for problem solving, but these tools had to be created together with both the refugees and the host community uh, 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 kids, the youth from both sides. And um, what happened was they created su successful solutions and became change agents in their own communities. And the results have shown that challenges can be turned into opportunities by members of the communities themselves. And this approach that we took was to 
facilitate empowerment, creativity, and confidence, and it, which was essential for, for creating relevant, meaningful, relevant, useful, and desirable solutions for themselves and giving them self-reliance. This self-reliance and change agents, building that among refugee and host community youth um, was important. But note here, there is no aspect for designing for refugees. There is a minimal aspect of designing with refugees. In this project, we facilitated design thinking and empowerment and empowered both the uh, refugees and the local youth to design their own solutions that were meaningful, relevant, useful, and desirable. And we all need to facilitate change, not design change, and use whatever tools you want to do it. It doesn't matter, just do it. Um, we have environmental challenges and global warming. And here, this brings me to the article by Lor Lorna Marshall, written in the 50s as well, about a tribe in the Kalahari Desert in South Africa. The article is called Sharing, Talking, and Giving, Relief of Social Tensions Among Kung Bushmen. Sorry, that's what the title is. Uh, the Kung strive towards a society where hostility and ill will are avoided. And this proves to be a challenge in a community when there is a lack of food. Now, all you have to do to realize how important the classics are to our work today is to take away the word food. So lack of that, that, that. And then look at the same context and see what happens. Um, according to Marshall, there are three customs they practice to avoid hostility uh, and maintain balance and social cohesion when there is a lack of food or a resource. They share, they talk, and they give. So share, dialogue, giving. This creates balance and balance is equilibrium, and equili equilibrium brings equality. I just came back from my uh, yearly moose hunt, where I hunt moose with a gun. We share our meat. We do. I don't buy any meat. I only eat meat I kill myself. Can an ethnographic story from the Kalahari help us to understand our own everyday lives at work and at home? as well as providing us relevance moving into the future? I believe so. Can it help us in what needs to be done? I believe so. Global warming, the drought, lack of resources and foods, we are going to see the haves and have-nots more and more clearly. Garbage and plastic in the world. And did you know it's also in outer space? Did you know that outer space is a dumping ground? This summer I spent uh, time with the world's leading authority on space law. He's 80 years old and desperately, with time on, not on his side because he's old, um, he wants to pass initiatives to stop the garbage dump in space that we've created so we can hook up our mobile phones and watch our televisions and Netflix and, and have our internet any place, anywhere, anytime. We were sold on all of this. It's not our fault. But do we know what has happened because we have it? I'm very proud of the EU who just banned uh, disposable plastics yesterday. <laughs> Woo! -hoo! And what about disposable diapers? Just think about the plastic in them. Did you know that it takes over 400 years for one diaper to uh, disintegrate? And do you know what happens when you burn them? Toxins go into the air. Now, just imagine how many diapers are out there, okay? I don't even want to think about it. So this is a problem. We need to save our planet, individual by individual, group by group, government by government, nation by nation, continent by continent. And this is my hunting, just so that you know I really do it. And why do I hunt? I started hunting four years ago. I was a pacifist uh, before then, never had touched a gun in my life. Um, it's, it's my way of fighting environmental challenges. I refuse to buy meat in the stores. I love meat, so I have to take responsibility for loving meat. And now I kill my own meat and I cry every single time I kill a living being. And that is my reverence. It's my reverence to these amazing creatures that I promise them that I will eat them and I will share that meat with others so that they too don't have to buy meat. 
We have a healthcare crisis and no technology in the world in all this welfare technology it drives me crazy. No technology in the world is going to replace that human touch. The biggest threat in society today is fragmentation. We have lost our community rituals, our family rituals. Rituals are the glue of social fabric. How can we create meaningful and relevant rituals in our families, in our communities, in our villages and cities, in our countries and in the world? You know, I just bought this apartment in Oslo and my reason for buying that one, it was way over my price range, was because it's one of the last apartments that has a ritual that is that the people share in bu uh, the building responsibilities. We, every person who owns an apartment there has to wash the steps. It, we haven't hired it out. And that creates a sense of community and belongingness. And I need that. I need that sense of belongingness. We know that all over the world we're seeing an increase in loneliness, depression, and stress due to increased need of production and effectiveness, largely due to that rapid speed of technology and the consequences of it. You know, email was supposed to make us more efficient. And yes, we read more emails and we get more emails and it all happens fast. I sat up there in the first thing, all stressed out, annoying some uh, people up there, really stressed because I was trying, I'm a really good person, but I get, when I get in that stress mode, I'm trying to write the rest of my presentation, finish. It's because I'm constantly bombarded with so much information overload, so many people trying to contact me and it just is, it gets to be impossible. And I know we've all been there, everyone in this room. Is this what we want for the generations to come? Some of my students built empathy furniture. Um, this is when we no longer know how to touch people, when we no longer know how to say hi to somebody and look them in the eyes, when we no longer know how to smile. And it's analog furniture that's supposed to help you learn to smile again. Say hi instead of hi. 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 And then the touching. They, they tested all of this because that was part of, you know, check. They had to test it out, so they took it, all this stuff to a shopping center. And who was it that put their cheeks on the, the human so that you could feel skin? Who was it? It wasn't children. It was old people. And now I, um, I need to talk about the aging group, um, which is increasing rapidly, and we need new principles and new guidelines. When is a life to be saved? When do we allow people to die? How can we design for this? This spring, I witnessed the perfectly designed death of my own mother. I was part of designing it, and who determines what a dying woman can and cannot have? And when did it become a government's right? This is her favorite quote. Just as I sh uh, shall select my ship when I'm about to go on a voyage, or my house when I propose to take a residence, she built her own house by herself when she was 60, so I shall choose my death when I am about to depart from my life. We fa had 19 days together. And she fell, I got a message, I got on a plane and went back to the island where she lives. And the first thing I found in the hospital was this, because this person found me. It was in the middle of the night. I'm trying to find my mother. And the janitor came and took me to her. And they have a policy. This is great service design. Uh, no pass zone. We never pass a patient visitor or debris without engaging. Isn't that an amazing goal to have in a hospital? Um, and I found my mother. And my mom told me, uh, I'm sorry, dear, uh, I'm, I'm dying. I have terminal cancer. Bam. Uh, and she said, get me the hell out of this hospital. I don't want another pinprick. I don't want anything. Just get me out. And we did. And uh, she had been thinking about death for a while because this is her coffin. It is made by, uh, uh, she, it was hanging on in her studio. Uh, <laughs> it's a dragon tail. Do you see the dragon tail? There, it's made from her grandchildren's playhouse. And she had made it, and she wanted to be buried in it. And I wanted to take her places, so I took her for her last visit to the beach um, in those 19 days. And we filled out paperwork to end my life in a humane and dignified way. She had to be 15 days in quarantine, um, and we were terrified that she wouldn't be able to hold the glass 
that would have the poison in it so that she could take her own life. Um, because they put you in a 15-day quarantine when you ask to end your own life. But she has a message to you all, and I want to share it with you. This is how we spent the 19 days. And food is very important in our family. Food is our language, not only of love, of conflict, of hate, and all of things. So you can always tell what person, someone's feeling by what we cook and what we make. Um, but anyway, I was uh, in charge of the food making. And this is what she tells us. This was three days before she died. She gave me a book. The book was the Tibetan book of living and dying. And that book told me how to survive, but it also had everything she ever cared about written in the side notes. So it was my story, and she had me reading it out loud to her every day. And then the day came. And she asked, because we're so neurotic about food in our family, she, uh, I make my own tonic for gin and tonics. So I had to make the tonic uh, first, and uh, she wanted her uh, poison in a good gin and tonic. And um, I don't know how many of you know um, the Twin Peaks, the TV series. Um, there's a character in it called Bob who's kind of scary. So um, this is my mom's last laugh an hour before she died, and it was when my daughter said to her, don't worry, Mom, Bob's not invited. She had a Buddhist a priest come. This was after she died, and she got exactly what she wanted. Um, she was buried in her coffin, or not buried, she was burned. She didn't want anyone to touch her, so we washed her. We put her in her coffin in the clothes we were supposed to go to Rome together. So these were the clothes she was going to wear uh, to Rome this August. And uh, there she is, uh, um, the way she wanted to be. And nobody touched her other than her family members uh, all the way to the crematorium. The reason I show you this is emotional for me, but we need new models for living and dying if we are going to hold on to humanity. We have uh, taken ourselves so far away from death that death is a beautiful thing. And those 19 days are the most beautiful days I've ever spent in my life. Um, we need to create tools for change, new tools for how to solve the challenges. We do that first by accepting that our professions, our expertise is no good without others. That we need diversity of thinking to solve little issues and big issues and stop thinking that we know best. We don't. And finally, one of my personal favorites is we need to find a balance between technology and humanity. And this welfare technology thing, I just have to bring it up. Because uh, today we're selling um, these uh, safety alarms that you put around the neck of old people. And this is why I moved out of my house. Because all I could imagine was that I was going to be left in a house for the next 50 years alone, um, uh, naked probably, alone, and with a, a safety, you know, one of those things around my neck so that nobody has to visit me. You know, all the, and, and, and that's just not a life I want to, li to live. And the reason this happens is um, because when we ask people, old people, today, this is an old lady, her kids don't live in, you know, near her, right? And if you ask her, would you like to stay at home as long as possible, or would you like to go to a home for the elderly? They're always going to say, stay at home, right? Why? Because this is the picture. They're asking the wrong questions. Why do you want to stay at home alone? Because I don't want to go there. Imagine if they could have in their minds this instead. This is what I want. I'm over the age. I'm ready to move in. Uh, this would be great. Um, we have created systems which ensure loneliness and depression as long as possible because we have to live alone as long as possible. Who is doing the addition and subtraction here? because they're not including the cost of being miserable in the accounting. Um, when I work in Africa, I think often that I'm only making a tiny dent in a much larger problem. But what keeps me going is this idea that there are people all over the world doing the same thing. What if we created a World Olympics filled with diverse thought, where we solve challenges locally and globally for the love of our planet and for the love of humanity? I think. What this is all about is that anthropology and our skills can make a difference. And you know, the question is how? By involving the people we serve, removing our ego, and practicing the art of humility, 
by maintaining an, uh, diversity and the transdisciplinary approach, whatever that approach means. Um, the challenges we face today will not be solved by one discipline alone. They will be solved when we work together. And I'd like to point uh, to one thing, and that is that a lot of the dilemmas and choices we have to make are found in the United Nations Sustainability Goals. But for us to succeed with them, we need to spice up our work with that diversity. We need to look at it, because here you can find all the business models that are broken. We need to change our business models. There's so much we need to change uh, in society. And we need to uh, apply our skills to solving these goals and challenges and understanding them at a local level and at a national level and global level. And then finally, I just want to end to remind us again of the importance of the classics, that uh, what we can learn from the Kung is think sharing, think dialogue, think giving, and most important of all, think doing. Be humble enough to realize that you can't do it on your own and that collabor collaboration across disciplines will save the world. Thank you. Thank you.